Hello all, I'm gonna, we're going to start our next session. I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, Dave uh, Schrader, who is going to uh, talk about a session uh, about securing institutional data in the mobile world. Uh, Dave has worked as a technologist in the central IT organization of the University of Wisconsin-Madison since 1995. He is currently an information technologist and strategist um, responsible for mobile programs, apps, services, and infrastructure at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He has also serves as a cryptologic uh, warfare officer in the United States Navy information warfare community. His expertise includes cyberspace um, operations and signals intelligence for policy systems and operations. So please help me welcome Dave Schrader. And do I need to be unmuted also? Can you hear me? Okay, great. Well, thanks everyone for coming to this session. Um, and I know that we're in the technical track, and we can get technical, um, but this is a little bit more wave top about strategy uh, of managing mobile devi devices in an organization. So um, before we start, can I get a show of hands for who here is from UW-Madison? OK, thank you. Uh, other UW system institutions? OK, a couple uh, other academic institutions? All right, and then um, industry in, or businesses in Madison or elsewhere? OK, great. OK, so this, this is focused on academia and largely uh, is in, a, in the context of UW-Madison. So um, that's how we're going to be talking about this. And first, uh, what is a mobile device? So OK, anything portable? Anything you can lose? OK. Any other thoughts on mobile devices? OK, so anything that needs batteries? OK. Yeah, so um, I think that, th uh, yeah, go ahead. So a device that we use in an area that is not OK. A device that is going to be used in an area that's not 100% managed by IT. And then we have a lot of the normal things that people think of as, you know, is it a phone? Is it a tablet? Is it a laptop? Is it anything that can be physically moved? So. Uh, there are a lot of definitions and kind of viewpoints on this. Generally speaking, the thing that makes a, a mobile device unique is that it's running a mobile operating system. So typically, we see a mobile device as a portable computing device. Sometimes it's a smartphone or a tablet. Typically, it's operated, you know, you can hold it in your hand or maybe two hands. Uh, I think a lot of times we try to include laptops in mobile devices. But the thing that makes mobile devices unique in the context of how we approach them and manage them when they're accessing corporate or organizational data is that they're running a different operating system than a lot of our other devices that we are managing. So things that are running traditional desktop operating systems, whether it's Mac OS, Windows, uh, what have you, that you know, if you think about where we've come over the last 15, 20 years or so in now bringing a lot of these systems that are running what, are, what we call our traditional desktop operating systems into management regimes and actually having worthwhile uh, anti-malware and antivirus and security software running on them, even if they're not managed. You know, let's face it, from Windows XP or before to Windows 10, We've come a long way. And so that's what we think of as a, a, a mobile device. In the context of UW-Madison, and I went back and looked at some of the uh, computing surveys that we've conducted over the last many years. And you know, just back in 2012, 2013, the answers we got back from people about, do you have a smartphone? 
were, you know, in the case of faculty and staff, less than half. In the case of students, you know, you'd think like, oh, well, that's not that long ago. But even that was, you know, 70, 70 to 80 percent, depending on what year it was. But now we've reached a point where, you know, it's just pervasive. And it's only 10 years. Just recently was the 10th anniversary of the launch of the iPhone, which, you know, aside from Palm devices and some of the other uh, devices that have been out there, that was really the first fully functional smartphone. And then with Android, you know, we're in a world now where you are carrying around a full-fledged computer in your pocket. It's an endpoint. We've got them institutionally owned. We have them personally owned. We have people who have multiple devices. We have people who have both of these devices or any combinations of them. And each of these devices, sorry, I have a grammatical error here, is part of our attack surface. They all together are a greater part of our and your attack surface. So to the extent that these devices are accessing institutional data, and many of them are, even if it's just things like email, whether it's uh, Office 365 or your organizational email, think about attachments, things that get cached, cloud services, Box, Dropbox, things that we sanction as a campus or an organization, things that we don't, things that people use because you heard in one of the prior talks, they got too many no's from security, they got too many no's from IT, and gee, it works really great when I do it this way. So that's where we're at with mobile devices. And so how do we think about mobile devices when we're protecting our institutional or organizational data? Um, what is our institutional data? Okay, we'll just, we'll just end it there because that, co yeah, that covers it. Does anyone else have any alternative answers? What's, or alternative facts, if you will? Almost everything. Okay, yep. So, uh, is it only data that's damaging if we lose it? Is it only data that's protected by law or policy? Is it only data that's worthwhile? Uh, no, it is any data that's owned or generated by UW-Madison. And a lot of this data is often protected by some kind of law or policy or regulatory regime, especially when you think of things like HIPAA, FERPA, FISMA, things like that. Uh, all of it is worth money and time to someone. Maybe some of it's worth more than others. And... Uh, Sometimes the, it's the data itself an attacker might be after, and sometimes it's the systems that that data is processed on. So who here has been, actually, I, I won't implicate you, who here is aware of data breaches that have happened at UW-Madison in the past? Okay, we've had data breaches. We've been on the hook to do data breach notifications because of, you know, things like, you know, the, your, your classic elements, social security numbers, uh, PII, things like this, getting exposed. In, a, in some of these cases, in many of these cases, I would argue, especially the further back you go, before there were the burgeoning black markets for selling things like medical records and credit card numbers and things like that, these attackers were using the systems as a vehicle to, you know, share pirated movies or, uh, you know, a pirated software. They didn't even necessarily care what was on the system. But we were still on the hook, and you were still on the hook, to do remediation and notification and deal with the bad publicity. There's been a data breach. X number of records have been exposed. All these people need to be informed about it now. So that's another aspect uh, that I would like people to think about. So here at UW-Madison, and I imagine at the other UW system schools, you know, we're, we're dealing with a similar uh, situation. We classify data based on its sensitivity, the risk of loss, 
And we have these categories, restricted, sensitive, internal, and public. But one thing I want to draw people's attention to is that I think it's very uh, easy to kind of look at the, the, the bottom part of each one of these data classification regimes and say, oh, it's restricted data if, the, if it's protected by law or regulation. And if it's in one of these restricted data categories, like uh, you know, SSN, uh, uh, PH, uh, PHI, PII, uh, financial account numbers, DNA profile, the things that are called out in the Wisconsin data breach notification law, for example. Well, those are really easy to identify. But really, that's not an and there. It's an or. So it's something that causes a significant level of risk, risk to the university affiliates or research projects. You know, this is like a, uh, this, that's a baseline. If it's, a, if it's one of those things, it is restricted data. But our research data can also be of imp enough importance or enough, high enough risk for its loss to be classified as restricted data. And same thing, when you look at these categories, restricted, sensitive, and internal, that research data is included in there. So how are we thinking about protecting it? You know, the government protects data with these classification regimes that correspond to what do we think would happen if it's lost? Would it cause exceptionally grave damage? Would it cause serious damage? Would it just cause damage? Well, these things are all subjective. How do you quantify, how do you define these things? How do you qualify these things? How do you quantify them? Uh, in the government, when we're dealing with classified information, some of these things travel on separate networks. They have mandatory encryption requirements. Uh, systems can't touch one another. There are completely different ways of handling data based on its sensitivity and the damage that it would cause if it were lost. So I would like us to think about our own data classification categories in the same way. And we do, largely. We have different ways of handling data uh, when it's in a restricted class, one of these protected data classes. But this is all institutional data, and these are our protected data classes. That's not to say that the public data is not important, too, but when we're talking about security, this is really what we're focused on. So any comments here? I'll stop for comments or questions. And please, if anyone has any questions or comments, uh, feel free to, jo to join in at any time. So again, UW-Madison context, but this is similar for other academic, uh, academic institutions that do research. Our annual budget is $3 billion a year. And over a third of that is research. So you can just look at the dollars there and know that's valuable. And are we being good stewards of the research data that we're helping faculty, scientists, and other researchers on campus uh, as they're collecting and generating this data? Are we being good stewards of that data and of the agencies, usually federal agencies, that have granted us that money to do this research? So who would want this research data, for example? Okay. There's one big example right there. Absolutely. Yep. Disgruntled employee, uh, foreign state actors, competitive or business interests who are looking for a competitive advantage against their own competitors. Activists who want to expose information about the, what the university is doing. In fact, we've seen examples of that on campus uh, multiple times with the Primate Lab. Um, we've seen some of the examples of, uh, some of you might remember, who remembers the cat research, where the photos leaked out of the cats, and I believe that was cochlear implant research, where, um, but the photos were very striking. And I think to people, a lot of people would look at that and go, wow. Why is the university doing that sort of research? That's bad publicity. The university leadership had to take time to respond to that. 
But that's just part of the documentation that was being generated on one of the thousands of research projects that's going on on campus. So the answer is really for anyone who it has value. And I think that a lot of times we have an attitude in a very open academic environment, which certainly uh, is the environment we live in, that, oh, we're just working on things for, you know, to add to the sum of human knowledge. No one w would want this information. What I'm doing isn't really important. But when you've got millions of dollars that collectively add up to over $1 billion a year that's coming into the university, especially at times when we're trying to protect the budget sources that we have, that information is under threat. And so to bring it back to the topic of this conversation, you know, everyone, faculty, staff, students, researchers, visitors, guests, university affiliates, people on the clinical side and the academic side of the medical school, uh, everyone is using mobile devices. And a lot of those mobile devices are accessing institutional data. And unlike the breaches that we discover and have to respond to and we get bad press about and things like that, we may never know about research data that's lost. Because if you have an actor that wants to come in and take the fruits of hundreds of man years and tens of millions of dollars of research, which some of our faculty members here have in their laboratories, and you don't want to have to pay for that all yourself or spend all that time doing it yourself, here it is for the taking. So think about our research data in that way. The crown jewels of really what we do as a research institution. Yes, we've got our uh, broader educational mission, but you know, we're uniquely positioned as a premier research institution, and I think really a national treasure, like a lot of the other large research institutions out there are. Um, that's the stuff that we also need to think about protecting. So the challenge, uh, how do we protect institutional data that's accessed by mobile devices? So who out here now has concerns about protecting your data that's accessed by mobile devices? OK, I see some people raising two hands. I, I hope everyone in here has, has at least a marginal interest in it, or else you wouldn't be sitting in front of me. Maybe you're just here for the CPE and you're already sitting in this room. That's cool, too. Um, but OK, so who here is doing any kind of management of those mobile devices right now? OK, I see very few hands going up, a couple. Um, I know we have people on campus who are doing it, sometimes because we have to, sometimes because we need to check boxes that the auditors will be more friendly with us about if we say, yes, we're doing this. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about mobile device management, which is pretty much the, you know, it's a general description for the systems that we will use as an organization to manage either organizational devices or non-organizationally owned devices that are accessing our corporate or institutional data. So what, do any, does anyone think of this when they think of MDM in the context of your personal device? I think that that's, you know, I've seen a lot of stuff, discussions online, especially at other academic institutions who have deployed MDM, uh, really that this encapsulates the view of MDM. And I understand it, because you're letting a outside entity that's not you into your device, if it's a personally owned device. I think for departmentally owned devices, this, this is a no-brainer. I think people in intuitively understand that when it's UW-owned equipment or uh, an enter enterprise-owned uh, device, that yes, uh, the, the organization has all access 
to the data on that device. It is not yours. It does not belong to you. So we accept that. But now what happens when we have increasing numbers of mobile devices being used in this context? So I think that there's, there has been a lot of discussion about uh, you know, the, the comparison to people using their personal uh, computers, their personal laptops, their personal computers at home for accessing this data. Well, people don't typically lose their computer that's sitting on their desk in their house. And because of how far we've come with security in general, again, over the last couple of decades with desktop operating systems, I think that we feel pretty good about someone using a web browser to access uh, you know, their, their uh, UW email or something to that effect. That's not to say that no one's computer at home has never been owned by some kind of attacker, and here we are. And that's not to say that no one's home computer has ever been utilized as a springboard into launching attacks against other UW systems, because they have. But with mobile devices, it presents a unique challenge, because they're a lot more likely to be all the things that you know, lost, stolen, misplaced, because of the way mobile devices work. Uh, they can be gamed a lot easier for things like phishing attacks and spoofing URLs in the, t in the uh, address bar of the browser when things get truncated, things like that. Rick, you look like you had a comment. No? OK. Um, so so that's, that, that's part of what we're dealing with when we're dealing with mobile devices. So what, what mobile device management is, it's just a way to administer and secure and manage mobile devices. Could apply to university-owned devices, could apply to non-university-owned devices. And that's kind of what people refer to when they see BYOD, bring your own device. When we talk about BYOD, it is the whole notion of how do we let people access the, our institutional data uh, and do work and contribute to uh, the, the workplace from their mobile device because productivity, I think some people, there's di probably disagreement on this, whether or not it adds or detracts uh, productivity-wise. Uh, but be that as it may, uh, people are using these devices. And even though we pay some lip service to, oh, well, you, you want to access institutional data uh, and you don't want to conform to our security guidelines, then, then carry two devices. Oh, but by the way, we also don't have the budget to buy you a device that's owned by the institution. So, you know, so, so the, and, that, and that's the reality in a lot, of, uh, a lot of places as well. So people are left with this, uh, you know, this question of, do I either do my work? Do I do things in a way that has the least amount of barriers to me to be able to do my work? Uh, and I think the, the, the answer a lot of people have is yes. Well, these devices are completely out of our control. We have no visibility on them whatsoever. Uh, I think some people might say, well, how is that different from people's personal computers? I respond by saying, it's not. But the combination of the mobility of mobile devices and the operating systems they're running is a much larger exposure for us. And lastly, MDM is a tool to implement or uh, to enforce IT and security policies in, in in the, in the service of the protection of institutional data. That's our goal here. MDM is not, and, and, and I say this both from a policy standpoint and sometimes from a technical standpoint with these products, it's not a way to spy on users' personal or private data. It's not a way to violate law or policy. Think about the systems that you have access to in, your, in the course of your duties. People who are system administrators, and have root or administrative access to systems, to the networks. I mean, if you want to, you can abuse that authority. But there's a trust that's placed in us, and we don't do that. So yes, there are ways, anytime there's a level of access granted to something, that that could be abused. And I think that's why we need to be very careful when we talk to our user base, and to leadership, and across the organization, about MDM, that this sort of thing and this is not the purpose of MDM. It is to protect our institutional data. So one example of 
MDM solutions that are out there, of which there are many. AirWatch, which is now part of VMware, is uh, one of the best of breed solutions that's out there. So some of you have heard of AirWatch. AirWatch is already in use on campus out at the hospital and in other locations. Um, it's a service that's out there. And so I will talk about some of these things in kind of an AirWatch context, but a lot of this applies to any MDM solution. So these are the kind of things that are possible with MDM. And so implicit in some of these things like inventory management and tracking. I think if you Googled AirWatch spying or what can AirWatch collect or something like that right now, that you'd see a host of articles that talk about how AirWatch or, or MDM products can collect, you know, you, you can collect your device's phone number, serial number, IMEI, uh, uh, MZ, you know, TIMZ, all of these kind of uh, uniquely identifying characteristics of a handset. It can collect a heck of a lot of data about a device. But because of, of Google and Apple's attention to security of the platforms of their mobile OSs, oftentimes it's not possible to get access into private applications. And that includes things like, so this is, so I'll stop there and say this is what is possible. And yes, I think this is the, the big thing that people always think about, remote wipe. So an administrator, someone that's not you, could remotely wipe your device. So how many people are aware that with Office 365, if a person is using the native email client, the native ActiveSync capability on iOS or Android, your device can be remotely wiped now? OK. And this is not a trick question. How many people have a problem with that? OK. And that's fair, because there's someone who's not you. You know, I, I, I was talking to the other day, and they're like, hey, I'm friends with my exchange administrators. We have beer together. We trust each other. I've worked with them for years. But I don't want them to have the ability to remotely wipe my personal device. And I think that is a perfectly valid position to have, because there's a sensitivity there when it comes to personal device. Now, we have sensitivities, too, which is the interest of protecting institutional data, sometimes of which is very valuable. So I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of edge cases and certain ways you might be able to do an end run around some of these things. But generally speaking, this is what's not possible, and there's more, with MDM, and or what we will not do as a matter of policy, which would have audit and enforcement behind it as well. The bottom line is, with MDM, the goal is not to look into a person's personal data. An organization like the University of Wisconsin or other organizations don't want to have that capability because it's a liability issue for us. Can you imagine also if there were the hint of someone even trying to do that with people's personal devices? That would be, uh, well, let's just say that would be bad. That would be just as bad as any kind of PR we might get from a data breach or the other kinds of losses that we're talking about. On the location information, uh, there are a lot of things that can be done with MDM, like geofencing, where perhaps the MDM solution and or the administrators behind it don't necessarily know exactly the location of a device, but when that device is more than X distance away from some waypoint or location, now it is no longer authorized to connect to a particular resource. So there are things like that, and that's why I say unless it's a business requirement. And those are things that the user has to grant permission for. So on today's Android and iOS operating systems, pretty much everything Android 6 or 7 and newer, everything iOS 9.3 and newer, the user is going to know irrespective of whether they may ignore the warnings or look at the dialog box once and dismiss it, the bottom line is you're going to know what exactly is being collected or what has the capability to be collected from your device. So I'm just kind of generically referring to 
administrative measures here to signify when might some action be taken like remote wipe. This is the policy that's in place here now at UW-Madison, paraphrased. I've taken out some of the extraneous text, but this is the bottom line. So we default to assuming a device is non-university owned if it's unclear. If it's a university owned device, that's pretty clear cut. If the personally owned device, now think of the case of the disgruntled employee or uh, you know, someone who is a uh, intentional bad actor, the insider threat that's just been discovered, and oh my god, this person has access to everything. And or we know they have all this data on their device. And this is serious uh, you know, intellectual property of the University of Wisconsin. And this, you know, maybe it's a research project, maybe it's someone who has access to one of our ERPs and has a database of literally everything, and it's on their mobile device. So that second bullet point, I think, is the compromise that we arrived at and would seek to adopt for, from a campus perspective for when dealing with personally owned devices. So I'll stop there, and does anyone have any questions or comments about this? Right. I think that, you know, and, and, and thank you for bringing that up. Uh, so the comment for the video was uh, that if, even if a decision is made to remotely wipe a personal device, there's a lot of churn that has to happen before and consultation with fairly high-level people at the university before that decision is even going to be made. I think that there is a legitimate concern about some people will say, hey, well, doesn't an administrator, you know, what if they go rogue? Don't they have access to do this? And the answer to that is yes. I mean, there's, there's checks and balances that can be architected in to uh, AirWatch, things like two-person control for, you know, you have to have another layer of verification to actually do a remote wipe. Um, a user can obviously request a remote wipe of their own device. You know, they're on vacation. They don't have access to find my iPhone, uh, you know, because they just lost their iPhone. And uh, now... They want it remote wiped because they know that they've got some uh, important things on it. So uh, that's another example. And obviously, if someone's determined to steal data from the university, and I'm talking about this as an, you know, from an insider context, if someone is using one of these devices and, th and they are, they've made a decision that they're going to misappropriate that data because they're working with a foreign actor, or they're getting paid, or they're disgruntled, or they just want to, or they're going to jump ship and go over to another research lab at another university. I mean, I'm not saying these things happen routinely, but that's not, really not what we're protecting against. We want to try to protect against the unintentional loss, external attackers, the fact that we have virtually no control, visibility, security, or anything that's centralized on these devices, and, and to help with insider threat mitigation. Because if you have to have a security regime enforced on a device in order to be able to access a certain resource, and you'll notice I'm being a little vague when I talk about this stuff, because there's a lot of imp different implementation decisions that could be made. And on this point, I would say the, the point of, of, of something like MDM on a campus that's as diverse as UW-Madison would be, the reality would be that deans and directors of departments and units are going to be the ones making decisions about implementation, about how exactly some of these decisions are made. And I think it's really important to point out, um, and it's really important to me, that with MDM, we have to communicate to users even in the context of departmental devices, uh, your personal and private information 
is paramount. The protection of it is paramount. And what facilitates that for us in many MDM solutions, and AirWatch in particular, is the ability to have uh, multi-tenancy where we can delegate administration to individual departments to make those decisions. Uh, Role-based access where certain administrators may have the ability to do one thing but not, say, remote wipe a device or do some of the deeper uh, uh, analytics that AirWatch might be capable of doing that could reveal personally identifiable information or private information. Um, users have the ability themselves, and of course you have to implicitly or explicitly trust that AirWatch is actually accurately telling you uh, the correct information, but AirWatch has a privacy app, for example, that lets the end user see, here's exactly what your admins can do, which may be separate from our own policy. Okay, yes, AirWatch lets us do these things because of an implementation decision, it says we can do them, but actually in policy we don't do that, which should be clearly articulated in a privacy statement that users are aware of and should have access to. Um, and there's the notion of a privacy officer in uh, the product and in many of these products that has oversight on key decision points when, when certain actions are taken that could implicate user privacy or, do, or something like a remote wipe. So there's another la layer of approval there that is required. And I think that you know, the, the key here is that we want users to feel and actually have full control over the privacy of their own personal or private information. Now, the, the other thing that we're going to be dealing with is, and this is related, so you know, these aren't mobile devices, but I really like this quote about the Internet of Things. Uh, if the video can't see it, it is the Internet of Things is shorthand for Internet of Things that should not be connected to the Internet. So, you know, you remember these uh, uh, Chinese-made uh, IP webcams that got roped into the uh, Mirai botnet that attacked Brian Krebs to the point of Akamai actually saying, hey, we got to cut you loose because we can't handle the traffic. You know, that started out as being something that was an over 650 gigabit per second denial of service attack and then morphed into an over one terabit per second denial of service attack that's using these little cheap cameras that are, you know, often unpatchable. They're not secure. The user of it doesn't care because it appears to be working properly. And it was cheap, you know. I don't know how some of these things can cost you know, $15 and be completely built and shipped over across the ocean. <laughs> and, and then ha you have a fully functional IP uh, webcam. But in any case, we've, we're starting to see a lot of these devices here. So at the keynote you, this morning, you heard another figure, 30 billion. Some people say as high as 50 billion. This is Gartner's latest estimate. But in any case, there's going to be more, many more, Internet of Things devices that are all themselves endpoints and have various degrees of intelligence and can be manipulated in different ways, and some of which, like when you think of things like, like the uh, Amazon Echo, uh, can have hooks into Office 365 and read you your email and cache some of that email and manipulate your attachments and interact with cloud services like Dropbox and things like that. And so these things are now implicated in institutional data. And the more intelligent these devices are, typically the more robust of an operating system they're running and the likelier they are that they're able to be managed as well. And I think a lot of the MDM vendors kind of got wise to this because their entire business model is based on paying per device, per year, or per person, or per something, per something per time. And the more things that are managed, the more money is involved there. But that's also, you know, so, so that's the reality. But that's also good because if we go down the road of implementing MDM, then we have opportunities to also 
get some control over these other kind of devices in some cases. Not always, but that's the other thing that I wanted to touch on here was the IoT. So what can we do is realize that every one of these connected, you know, so every connected device is part of our attack surface, but that attack surface is exploding and the nature of it is changing. It's becoming more open. There are more ways that you can attack a target via things like mobile devices and then separately IoT devices. A lot more ways than, not, not to diminish the, fa the, the role that traditional desktop and server operating systems play here, because those things are breached as well, but how many people saw Rob Joyce's talk at Usenix from a couple of years ago? So you might not know Rob Joyce by name, but this was the guy who is the head of the National Security Agency's tailored access operations who gave a talk about how they hack into other things, like foreign intelligence targets and what have you. And it's basic hacker methodology. I mean, it's sit down, look for vulnerabilities, spearfish people or whale people, you know, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we see this, the numbers all the time. Leadership in organizations, private, academic, government, military, when they receive these phishing emails, they click them. I mean, they just do. And, it's, and, and the, the numbers really haven't gone down. Um, once you kind of teach to one point, it, uh, you, know, you change things around a little bit. And, it, and, and so that's still a very effective method, phishing. Again, just like you heard at the keynote this morning. And it's even more effective, it's enabled by some of the unique features like screen size and what have you of mobile devices and some of the other connections they might have to other services that where credentials are, you're already logged in and now an attacker has access. Someone uses this as a mechanism to move laterally now within a network. They gain access to your phone. Your phone has trusted access on the wireless network at the university. And here you are. So, I'm not going to go through all this stuff. You know, there's a lot of things that are possible with MDM. You remember this slide from before? You saw this slide before? Well, every single one of these items was discussed as things that people wanted to be able to do at the BYOD and Cloud IT Policy Forum from last year. No one said MDM by name because I think it was almost like, you know, it sh that shall not be named. It was the Voldemort. No one wanted to, to say, hey, we really need MDM. Uh, and I did a survey last year that I'm sure many of you participated in, uh, and we had over 60 IT professionals out in the, the units on campus here that said that we really had a need for MDM. So to that end, um, we are uh, instituting a pilot uh, of AirWatch that's a central MDM service, and uh, you know what, wall of text, but this is what a central MDM solution will do for us. And this is an opt-in solution, and it is architected in such a way that you, in conjunction with deans and directors, will be the authority for how this is implemented. Now, will, will there be a time in the future that the CISO or the chancellor, uh, you know, w the CISO via the chancellor says something like, you know what, any devices that access institutional data are going to be managed, or they're going to just be dumped onto a guest network where you have access to nothing. Now, I personally don't believe that's going to happen. You know, but 10 years from now, I don't know what it's going to look like. But we have to get a handle on this somehow, and I think that we should get out in front of it. And what can you do if you believe this is valid? Now, this is really targeted at UW Madison users. Please visit this site. Please join the MDM list. Um, please talk about your concerns with MDM. Uh, with, talk about it with me. Reach out to me. Uh, talk about it in the IT policy and governance forums. And the reason why I mentioned this too in my last 30 seconds of talking is uh, ideally this is something that saves the university money, prevents us from damaging, damaging data breaches that we either know or don't know about, and might end up being able to be architected as a service that is centrally funded so that we don't have anyone missing out on these capabilities in their labs, their units, their departments. So with that, any questions or comments? 
Okay, thank you very much.